Great to see you, Calvary. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 7. We're going to be looking at Luke 7 as we're continuing our impossible series, looking at the miracles of Jesus. And I just want to remind you, if you're in a place where you're really wondering if God can redeem or restore your brokenness and your situation, uh, Jesus specializes in the impossible. So uh, just grab your Bible, turn to Luke 7, find it uh, on your Bible app, and join us as we look at the impossible things that Jesus does. Now, speaking of impossible, it seems impossible that we have been shut down due to the coronavirus for eight weeks. Eight weeks, I mean, uh, that just is crazy, and it seems impossible that we're missing celebrations like proms and birthdays and graduations and anniversaries and today, so uh, by the way, happy Mother's Day. It, it is a day of celebration, but it's also a day when a lot of you are not able to celebrate the way that you want. There's some of you that are freaking out because you're gonna actually, ha actually have to cook for mom instead of take her out to dinner. So uh, praying for you, just want you to know that. But um, we're looking at a miracle today involving a mom. Uh, in fact, it's involving a grieving mom to be precise, a mom whose hopes and dreams and expectations for life have been shattered and broken, and, and she's really hopeless. And there may be some of you watching today that can relate to that. Maybe some of you that are grieving because you, you can't hug your kids or your grandkids, or you're grieving because you miss your mom. Uh, she's gone, and, uh, and you're filled with sorrow. So uh, let's look at the story, and let's see the impossible things that Jesus does. Uh, Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. Uh, Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then Jesus came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still, and, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. And fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about Jesus spread through the whole of Judea and the surrounding country. Now, this brief account holds lots of impossible, and it offers us encouragement and hope no matter what we're facing today. So I hope you can hear that. And I want to begin by sharing with you the first thing that we need to hear from this story is that Jesus has compassion on you. Jesus has compassion for you. Uh, notice, this is not a planned event. I mean, Jesus is just traveling. There's a crowd following Jesus. They're coming into a town called Nain, and he just meets up with a crowd coming out who is getting ready to bury this young man. Uh, and uh, understand, in that day and, and time, uh, as soon as someone died, they pretty much wrapped him up, carried him out, put him in a tomb uh, in a hillside cave someplace. And, and that happened usually within 24 hours of the death. Uh, and that's still kind of a custom today. And, and it says in verse 13, when Jesus saw her, he had compassion on her. He had compassion on her. She was a widow. She had no husband to provide for her. She had lost her only son. So she had no son to provide for her. She was grieving. She was destitute. She was powerless. She was hopeless. And Jesus acted with compassion. Uh, See, I, and I just can't, I can kind of see Jesus imagining Mary's grief that is going to come at his death in a couple of years. I mean, after all, his mom was a widow. He'd already seen that grief uh, of her losing her husband. But Jesus knew that he had brothers, half-brothers, and they were going to be able to take care of Mary. And, and here was this woman, and she had no sons to care for her. Uh, now, by the way, this isn't an isolated incident. Jesus had compassion throughout the Gospels when you read them. When Jesus saw the crowds of people, he saw them as being sheep without a shepherd, and he had compassion on them. When Jesus fed the multitudes, the, both the 5,000 and the 4,000, it says he had compassion on them. Uh, when, uh, when Jesus healed the blind men on the side of the road, they called out to him, he had compassion on them. When Jesus encountered the leper, 
He reached out and touched the leper because he had compassion on him. And I want you to know today, Jesus has compassion for you. For you. Uh, whether you are struggling uh, or broken or sick, uh, whether you are depressed or despairing, see, in whatever form of brokenness you're in, Jesus has compassion for you. It doesn't matter if it's physical brokenness or emotional pain, if you're grieving or if financially you're, you're just losing, or if it's spiritual brokenness. The God of creation sees your pain, and he wants to bring healing and hope to you. Now, right now, you may not feel like God has compassion on you. you. You may not be experiencing it in the way that you want. You might even be asking, why me, and why now, and why this? But I want you to know that Jesus has compassion for you. Uh, you might be just like this, this widow who thought her world was over, and she had no hope before God intervened and did the impossible. So today, uh, I hope you can see in this impossible story that Jesus has compassion for you. And the second thing I want you to see in this story is that Jesus loves people more than rules. Jesus loves people more than rules. Uh, it's easy for us to miss this in the story because we see nothing wrong with touching a casket or with uh, a family member at a, at a viewing uh, of a body to, to touch the body. That, that's pretty normal. You might think it's awkward, you might think it's a little creepy, but it's completely uh, normal in our culture. But in Jesus' day and in the Jewish culture, that was extremely radical that Jesus stopped and touched the funeral bier. That, that platform they were carrying this man on uh, because it was out of line. In Jesus' day, the custom was people died and you buried them quickly and as few people as possible touched the body because if you touched the body, you were unclean. Uh, and unclean means you can't go out in public for a certain period of time. It means you can't sacrifice at the temple until you are clean again. It means you can't worship at the synagogue. Uh, it pretty much uh, makes you an outcast for a season while you meet the requirements of the law. So Jesus touched the funeral bier, uh, and according to the religious rules of the day, Jesus was unclean. Except Jesus is the one who made the rules. I mean, think about it. He is God in the flesh, and he is by nature clean. It's impossible for Jesus to be unclean. I mean, he's, he's perfect. He's sinless. He's God in the flesh. And Jesus made it extremely clear in his teachings and his actions that the rules and commandments that are given to us through Scripture are given to bless us and protect us, not to imprison us or steal joy from us. It was just evident in everything that Jesus did. Uh, that, that's why uh, Jesus broke the religious rules all the time. That's why the religious leaders hated Jesus. Because Jesus touched the lepers. He touched the dead bodies. He healed on the Sabbath. Because he made it extremely clear that to God, people matter more than religious rules or traditions. They, they just, we do. Now, I say that, please don't hear me saying that God's commands are optional. They are not. Okay? He's God, he's righteous, he's holy, he's given us these commands to follow and to live in order to lead us to a life of blessing and peace and hope and joy. That's the purpose of God's commands. And God's commands protect us from our own self-destructive impulses if we get right down to it. And so his commands are for a purpose, and yet Jesus, who's the one who gave these commands to us in the first place, summarized all of the commands of Scripture in two statements, what we call the Great Commandment. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole of the law and prophets rest on these two. They rest on these two. Uh, religious people love rules, by the way. In fact, they love rules more than they love people because it's easier to control people than to love people. Uh, Henry Nouwen is the one who said that, wrote that in his book, In the Name of Jesus, and uh, it's a great book if you want to read it. But he said it's easier to control people than to love people. And, and religious rules try to, try to control people's behavior. Now, uh, think of it this way. We're in sort of a rule-dominated moment in our history, right? I mean, we are, we're, we've always been a nation of laws, and that's what gives us order and, and allows America to be such a successful place. But 
But right now, we are living in a heightened rules culture because we've got rules about social distancing and shelter in place and and all these rules. Everywhere you go, there's signs telling you what to do and where to go and how to do it and what not to do. And and we wait for pronouncements from the president or the governors to say, here's what you can do and can't do. And, and, uh, And some of you are really good at following rules. And some of you are not. In fact, if you're watching this with a group of people, you might go ahead and just confess together who's good at at following the rules and who's not good at following the rules. You probably don't need confession. You already know that. But some of you right now are thriving in this rules-based environment. I mean, every time you go out of the house, which is rare, like once a week maybe to go to the grocery store, you've got a mask on, you've got gloves on. I've seen people driving in their cars alone with masks. I've seen people riding a bicycle outside with masks. Uh, there's people who, who, who take hold of this. I mean, when you're in the grocery store, you follow the arrows on the floor. Can I just confess, I didn't even know there were arrows on the floor until about a week after they were there. And, and, and some of you are just really good at that. The social distancing thing, you've got it down. Others of you, not so much. Others of you don't leave the house once a week. You leave the house once a day. You go to the grocery store every single day. You don't, you don't follow the arrows on the floor. You're talking to people. You've, you, you know, your friends have given you masks to wear, and you don't even know where they are. I mean, you're just not a rule follower. And, uh, and we got to remember that, that wh- whatever type of person you are, it's okay. Uh, we, we want to uh, allow each of us to be who we are. But here's the thing we can all agree. The rules that are in place right now are to control our behavior. They want to control our behavior for a good reason, to mitigate the whole uh, COVID-19 thing, but uh, they're trying to control our behavior. And religious rules are the same way. They're trying to control people, not to bless people, because churches want people to act a certain way. And maybe some of you have even experienced that in a negative way where Uh, A church was very demanding and judgmental and harsh about the way you live or the things you think or the way you're conducting your life. And and some of you are even trying to still meet those religious rules. And and so I just want to speak to you for a moment. If you're trying to be a good person, if you're trying to pass all the religious rules so that God will love you and accept you, uh, and you're feeling guilty all the time because you fail, uh, can I just encourage you to stop trying Stop trying to be a rule-following person. Stop trying to please God by by keeping all the rules that the religious people tell you. Stop trying to be good and just receive God's grace. Look, Jesus loves you. He died for you. He wants to forgive you. And, and, And when you understand that, when you understand that it's all about grace and you receive God's grace, and instead of focusing your life on keeping the rules, you focus your life on loving God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. It it changes everything. Your life becomes pleasing to God. By the way, loving your neighbor means that you are patient and kind toward your neighbor, even if they don't follow the rules as well as you, or even if they follow the rules and you don't. It it means respecting people and treating people with kindness. That's what it means. Focus your life on loving Jesus and loving your neighbor. And your life will be pleasing to God. See, this is the Jesus ethic. It's not that the rules are unimportant, because God's rules are eternal. It's that when you love people and you love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you're exceeding the rules. You're doing better than the rules even said. So um, I hope you can see that, that Jesus loves you more than he loves the rules. And Jesus has compassion for you. And and then finally, I want you to see in the story that Jesus has power over death. Jesus has power over death. He raised this young man from the dead. He did the impossible. The Gospels also tell us that he raised a young woman from the dead. And and then uh, in John chapter 11, it's the story of Jesus raising an older man, Lazarus, from the dead after he'd been dead for four days. And of course, ultimately, Jesus died to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead. And in Jesus' death and resurrection, he defeated sin and death and hell. Completely and totally defeated sin and death and hell. And and understand how that matters to us because our rebellion, our sin, our choices of defying God meant that our destiny was death and hell. Death and and hell. That was our only destiny, it was our only option. But because of Jesus and his actions on the cross, 
Because of his resurrection from the dead, our destiny will be eternal life and heaven if we're followers of Jesus. Are you a follower of Jesus? Have you come to that place where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world? You believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins? You believe that he was raised from the dead and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus with your life? See, if you've done that, then you understand this whole victory over sin and death and hell. If you haven't done that and you want to, let me talk to you just for a moment. Right now on your screen, uh, depending on which format you're watching this on, th there's an opportunity for you to push a button that says, I want to uh, receive Christ or I need prayer. I'm just going to encourage you to, to click that button. And we've got people who are going to respond with you, talk with you, pray with you, encourage you in this journey. Uh, they and if you're watching later in the week and this isn't uh, one of our, our live streams, then uh, please email us at calvarylhd.com and allow us to reach out to you. We want to help you follow Jesus. Or maybe you've trusted Christ, but you've never been baptized and you want to declare your faith publicly in Jesus. Then again, reach out right now. Put, click the button. Let us get with you and plan that. Uh, now, if you've trusted Jesus as Savior, if you know that he's changed your destiny, then uh, I want to talk to you for a minute. So if you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to know the life-changing power of Jesus over death because it changes our attitudes about life. When you understand Jesus' life-changing power over death, it changes your attitude about life. Now, recently, because of the pandemic, a lot of people have just had an increased amount of fear and anxiety in their lives. They're worried about getting sick and about dying. And, and look, some of them are afraid for themselves. Some are afraid for their loved ones. Uh, look, that can be overwhelming. That's a real fear, and it's understandable. But Jesus wants us to have peace, no matter the trials we face in this world. Uh, look, Jesus spoke these words to us. Uh, John chapter 16, he said... These things I have told you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. So knowing that Jesus has power over death will give us peace. Now some of you are saying, are, are you trying to imply that Christians aren't going to suffer from COVID-19? We're not going to get sick and die from this? Not at all. In fact, I guarantee you Christians will die from the coronavirus. Christians will die from cancer. Christians will die from heart attacks and strokes. Christians will die from drownings and car accidents and homicides and terrorism and malaria and birth defects and a host of other diseases and accidents. That's a reality that we are all born into a broken world and we are tainted by sin and we choose to sin. We choose to defy God. And the wages of that sin is death. That's part of our reality. We suffer that physical consequences of sin which is death. So are you feeling better now? Death is inevitable. By the way, I should say Happy Mother's Day again at this point. Some of you are going, wow, this is the hope you're sharing with us? Yes, it is. Hang with me. You see, the young man who was impossibly raised from the dead in this story, he's dead. He died again. Yeah, that, that probably isn't really fun to have to die twice, is it? But he's not still walking around talking about how Jesus raised him from the dead. You see, preventing death is not the point. I just want you to understand this. The gospel is not about preventing death. God's goal isn't to prevent your death. God's purpose is to defeat death so you can live. Okay, let me say that again. God's goal is not to prevent death. God's purpose is to defeat death. And Jesus did that in his death and resurrection. That's why Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. Okay, it's, it's not about what's happening right now. The difference is what happens after you die. And if you're a follower of Jesus, then what happens after your, your death is life, perfection, peace, joy beyond your imagination. We're talking about heaven where there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain because all of that is done away with and all things are made new. That's our hope in Jesus. And if you know that, it changes how you live. If you know that, then you live that out, not reckless, recklessly, but courageously. Not foolishly, but you demonstrate the power of love and the presence of peace through Christ in your life. See, Jesus wants you to live that confident peace that he gives 
so that we are not captive to fear. Now, if we can do that, if we can live courageously and peacefully and joyfully, even in the midst of the trials, guess what happens? The people who are desperate, who are despairing, who are fearful, even those who are hopeless will be drawn to Jesus because they'll see Jesus reigning in your life because he's the one who defeats death. Um, today, I pray that you know that Jesus has power over death. I pray that you know that he loves you more than rules and that Jesus has compassion for you. Will you pray with me? Father, thanks for the hope we have in Christ, for his victory over death, and for the reality that uh, nothing can separate us from the love and compassion of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, we're going to celebrate communion together. So I hope you have the, the elements at your house. Uh, and uh, in just a moment, I want to lead us in that. Uh, I hope you have some bread or crackers, some juice or wine or whatever it is that you want to take. And uh, I would remind you that celebrating communion is for followers of Jesus. Those who've already placed their faith in him, we've talked about that. Uh, it's a reminder that God is in control, that he loves us and he demonstrated that in Jesus. And so we have hope that can fill our lives and change the way that we live because we have victory over death. Scripture tells us on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it and gave thanks. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. May God bless you and your family and your loved ones in Jesus' name.